Fogo Island, barren, rocky, windswept, facing the North Atlantic. An isolated island off an isolated coast. Its harbors choked with Arctic ice for half the year. If any part of Newfoundland would bend to the winds of change, you'd think it would be Fogo Island. For Fogo was remote, Fogo was backward. Like most of our outports, the way of life had changed but little in 200 years. Its 5,000 people were scattered in a dozen coves. All about, Newfoundland outports were crumbling as governments encouraged people to abandon the old way of life and to move to growth centers, to places where industrial development would provide new jobs, new opportunities, and where the government services would be more conveniently provided. Resettlement was suggested on Fogo. It was talked about in the homes of the fishermen and even from the pulpit, where everyone could see Fogo was in a bad way. Outward appearances were deceiving. The homes were neat and strong, and there were no mortgages. But it was getting hard to make a living on Fogo Island. Until recent years, the Fogo Island fishermen had always done quite well with trap boats and schooners. The waters around the island rarely failed. All the fish were split, salted and dried, and exported to the Mediterranean and the West Indies. But the salt cod industry upon which Fogo Island depended exclusively was old and shaky. It had been ignored by our politicians who had fallen for the glamorous dreams of industrialization. It had been crippled by disorganized and greedy businessmen who practically ruined the markets. It had been neglected by technology. The old industry was beginning to stagnate and rot, chained to centuries-old methods and controls. Neatly tucked under Mother Ottawa's wing now and courting the millionaire industrialists, Newfoundland let the fishery fade into the background, while foreign fleets built up unchecked and uncontrolled until they practically took the cod from our doorsteps. Before we knew it, a host of foreign nations were vacuum cleaning the northern spawning grounds of the codfish. Here on Fogo, the effects of the intense fishing pressure offshore was first felt about 10 years ago. The splitting tables at seldom come by, abandoned at what should have been the peak of the fishery. In better times, a group of men would be clustered around each of these tables. The codfish seemed finished. One by one, the old established businesses pulled out of Fogo Island. Some had been merchants there for generations. With them went the fishermen's source of credit, for here, as in all Newfoundland outports, fishing was an intricate system of supply and credit. You bought from the merchant, you sold to him. He ordered supplies for the fishery, the engine parts, the salt, the ropes, the gear. And now the Fogo merchants are gone. They didn't want to sink their money in a dying community. Their homes, their stores, their businesses, all left to decay. Free enterprise on Fogo was essentially dead. It wasn't just the small boatmen who were crippled by the decline in the inshore cod fishery. The Labrador men died too. The fleet of schooners that proudly sailed to the coasts of Labrador failed to make profitable voyages three years in a row. There was just no fish, again because of the foreign fishing pressure on the offshore Labrador breeding grounds. And so the old skipper men abandoned their vessels to rot along the shores of Fogo Island. Once proud little communities began turning into welfare ghettos, by 1968, hundreds of Fogo families were living on the dole. Houses were boarded up as family after family left for the glittering streets of Toronto. Anywhere to escape the slow death of living in a land with no future.
It's a long boat ride from Fogo, and then you're still on a remote corner of Newfoundland. The glittering streets of Toronto seem a long way off. And yet there was no real exodus from Fogo. Not that many families left. Mostly it was the very young, many of whom would probably have left anyway. Newfoundland has always exported people, and a good thing too. For with our birth rate, the island would have sunk long ago from the sheer weight of numbers. But many people, most of them, would not move from Fogo. They saw little to attract them to the factories of the big cities. And yet they knew there was really little hope for their island, with the major businesses gone and the fishery collapsing. And official minds thought more and more of evacuation and resettlement. Then one day, Fogo Islanders woke to the sounds of caulking hammers, saws and planes. They were building ships on Fogo Island. The Fogo Island Shipbuilders Cooperative had been born. If the fishermen of Fogo could build bigger boats, medium range long liners that could exploit new fishing grounds and new species, well, maybe the fish free could be revived. Big boats cost money, but with boat building bounties and free labor, even a $50,000 craft is within the grasp of a good fisherman. The shipyard itself cost $70,000 and the provincial government footed the bill. A gamble on their part to be sure, for fishermen's cooperatives in Newfoundland have had at best a shaky record. And finally, the day came when the first of the longliners was launched. A proud day for builder Jim Decker. When I launched the first, when we launched the first boats, I, uh, well, in fact, I felt pretty proud over it to see, you know, such a achievement because prior to that, there was a lot of talk, probably it wasn't going to come to anything, and, you know, what are they going to do with this? What are they going to do with them boats? They'll never build them and this kind of stuff. And when they went afloat, yeah, it was a proud day, of course. From then on, the Fogo shipyard didn't look back. Longliners were built, four at a time, creating much needed employment, but even more important, stirring in the people a new interest in the fishery and in Fogo itself. If this growing fleet of longliners could catch the fish, maybe Fogo could survive. For each of these boats is a small industry in itself. Some could catch, in a really good year, as much as a million pounds, and that's worth about 60,000. Each boat takes a crew of four men, and processing ashore keeps maybe a dozen others busy, packing, handling, filleting, trucking. In those boats lay the future of Fogo Island, and the people knew it. The old-timers watched with interest as the little fleet of longliners came home from the fishing grounds. These boats were a far cry from what they were used to, the open skiff and the Labrador schooner. Would they find the fish? Would they be able to adapt to new methods of fishing? Well, they soon found that the skills of their fathers had not been lost. Right from the start, they did well, but not with the codfish. It was the turbot and the flounder new species that filled the boats. This might be the answer. Yet while everyone was encouraged by the rebirth of the fishery, these new fish the boats were catching could not be salted like the cod. It had to be sold fresh, and there was no freezing and filleting plant on the island. The co-op had to look for outside buyers to come and collect the fish. This meant a loss of shore labor and also a loss in market quality. To many, including Dan Roberts, the manager of the co-op, this is now the only real stumbling block to development and full employment. Well, the only species of fish that uh, we can handle and process here on the island is codfish. The only way we can process that is to have it split, salted, and dried. All other species have to be shipped out in larger collectors, iced, 
in the raw state, which has to be taken to other processing plants. Sometimes it takes three and four days before fish is delivered there. There's a very serious loss in quality and lots of degrading. Sometimes we had to suffer that financial loss ourselves. Five years of putting in their energy and money, 5% actually of their earnings in the hope of obtaining some processing facilities whereby all this fish that we're shipping out now can be kept here on the island along with the labor required to process it. Uh, the, most of our fishermen, you know, feel that we can't carry on like this very much longer. We have to have some sort of processing facilities in order for us to sustain our economy and for people to, to continue earning a good living here. There's no doubt that there has been a change of attitude uh, in regards to our provincial government. Uh, when I met just now by pressures for resettlement, uh, the government wasn't spending any money here in public services, like roads, schools, and so on. But this last two or three years, they have been spending quite large sums of money on the road improvement and even pavement this year. And with a brand new Central High School at a cost of about seven, $700,000. This is evidence uh, that the provincial authorities realize that we're here to stay and we're determined to make a living. But unfortunately, there are people in Ottawa who still think people should be moved and regardless of the fact whether they can get a living if they leave from here, I don't think they worry too much about it. They just want to change their way of life that they think other people should live. Problems, worries, of course, but the standard problems of any growing progressive town. Someday they'll get their fish planted. Whether it's a cooperative effort or a free enterprise doesn't seem to matter anymore. Where there's a feeling of pride and accomplishment on Fogo Island today. Here's how fisherman Don Best feels about the co-op and its future. It has meant that the, 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 the earning power of the people has increased, I say, at least 100%. Or otherwise, call this way, you give you an example. We got that shipyard down there, there's 30 people employed. Last year, the failure to sell on fish plant, not that we had about, oh, 40 or 50 employed from May up to Christmas. And I hardly tell how much. But the whole economy of the island now is geared to the cooperative. Now, take the cooperative out, or the labor they're providing, the money they're paying out. For, other, for species of fish other than cod, and you've got nothing to all left. The people will be, be penniless. I would say 95% of the people. It depends on the cooperative for a livelihood. Either directly or indirectly. But the cooperative started going to the shipyard and got this fleet of long liners, and that changed the whole picture. It was a big improvement. Because on cod fish alone today, you never, never, never survive. There's not enough left. But like we are now selling all kinds of fish, different species, just there's a chance. And if we had our own fish plant, get far enough to get our own fish plant, I think we would be on the top shelf. Surely there are more favorable climes in Canada and thousands of places where opportunities are greater. What is there then about these remote places that makes people want to stay? You can't call it love of the soil, there isn't any. Love of the rocks maybe, or love of the sea, maybe that's part of it. According to the textbooks, according to the economic planners, they should move. In spite of the success of the cooperative on Fogo, the average income probably falls far below the so-called national poverty line. 
But as long as an Outport Newfoundlander has a chance to earn a decent living, he's quite happy in his rocky setting. Poverty lines are artificial. A way of life, a style of life, isn't. Maybe you can see how a Newfoundlander raised in an outport can develop a fond attachment to this rough land, to a lifestyle that is in many ways unique. You might find it more difficult to understand why some young people are willing to move from city to outport and to this way of life. Every year, more and more of them come to Newfoundland, and almost invariably, they shun the sheltered towns and valleys and pick these rocky outports. Two young teachers, Peter and Susan Crossley from Ontario, picked Fogo Island. We uh, met a Newfoundland artist, David Blackwood. He showed us slides of around the island here and uh, we were intrigued. Well, after a year of teaching in Ontario, again in a private school, we thought that would be our thing. We, uh, we left and moved here. That, that was a year ago this summer. The ideas involved in this, in this particular school, I think, are, are unique and, and new across Canada, in, in our own experience, we'd say that. The island here is uh, isolated, of course, from the mainland of Newfoundland, which in turn is isolated from the rest of Canada, of course, but it was, I say, it was amazing that you would find in such a remote place such, such a, a daring, daring uh, attempt to make education uh, an important and meaningful experience for the, for the children. The children here in Fogo are, are very, I find, much more al alive and um, they, many of the new ideas are very, very new to them. We wouldn't have survived this last winter as well as we did without help from all our neighbors. Just tonight uh, I have a little fellow from across the road passing me nails and the man next door uh, is building the porch addition. He's a carpenter and certainly he, he won't ask Toronto labor rates, that's for sure. He would just get a uh, he would ask for a minimum wage at most. The school which attracted these young people symbolizes a new spirit of cooperation among religious factions, strong enough to break the curse of denominational education. And it also symbolizes a change of heart by government, for it's a big investment in a place that was dying a few years ago. There wasn't even an election coming when this asphalt was being laid. Paved roads are taken for granted in most places, but here, a ribbon of asphalt means an end to kidney-jarring potholes and clouds of summer dust. And a chance to promenade a new generation of Fogo Island fishermen. Gone is the air of defeat and hopelessness. Welfare, once the sole support of many families, especially in the wintertime, has been drastically reduced and a way of life has been secured. Maybe rescued is the word. Fogo Island is an old place by North American standards. No one knows who were the first people here. All we know is that they came here a long time ago and developed their own way of life, their own way of doing things, and their own way of expressing themselves. Here lieth the body of John Gobi, who died in June 1763 age 33 years. Affliction sore, long time I bore, physician's art was vain, till death did ease and God did please to end me of my pain. Young and old, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare for death and follow me. In memory of Anne Sims, who died Fogo in 1874, aged 66 years. But all this wistful talk of preserving a way of life, of keeping the old-fashioned Newfoundland outports intact, 
is nothing but sentimental nonsense if the people there are living in poverty. And that's just the way Fogo was a few years ago. Redevelop or resettle? That seems to be the basic question in many Newfoundland outports today. 400 of them, just like those we've seen today on Fogo Island, have disappeared since we've joined Canada. Tens of thousands of Newfoundlanders have been swallowed up in larger centres, adopting a different way of life. It's a familiar story all across this country, but many outports survive, not by resisting change, but by welcoming it. Fogo Island is such a place. Change hasn't come to Fogo Island, though, at the expense of community and the way of life. Its people retain the best of the old. They can still roam the barrens and the sea, fishing, hunting, birding, berry picking. They still own their own homes. The communities on Fogo Island remain intact. Jobat's Arm, Tilting, Stag Harbor, Seldom Come By, and the others. The people of Fogo Island chose redevelopment over resettlement, and so far, it seems to be working. This is important because the future of hundreds of small outports along the northeast coast of Newfoundland depend on the success or the failure of the Fogo venture. Come back tomorrow, I'll give you another one, boy. 